We are live. We are there. I'm glad to still be alive. (laughs) We're live and Andy just leaves. (laughs) Yeah. All right. (laughs) We're back. We're here. We're live. Uh, One second here to make sure we are good to go. And we are. There we go. We're live here on the fourth episode of Taylor Primetime. Welcome back, gentlemen. Hey guys. Welcome, Mr. Powers. Our, for having me here. Our special guest today is Andy Powers, our master guitar designer at Taylor Guitars. Um the last time we tried to go live with Andy, uh the we broke the internet. Uh therefore we're gonna try it again. And we'll so try it again. And this time uh, I charged I charged my phone. Because <laughs> that was the problem. I totally know it was the problem. Uh, Might have been. <laughs> that sounds awesome. So no, we took we took a a, a little bit of um some a peaceful solidarity break last week, and uh, the week before that we broke the internet. So now we're gonna try it again. Uh, today's episode of Taylor Prime Time is what does bracing do for acoustic guitars? So we figured we'd bring Andy Powers on so that he could tell us the truth. Make sense? Okay. Yeah, makes sense. You want to hop right into it? And yeah, just a second. Of course, okay. everyone knows my name's Jay. I got Andy Lund somewhere up in the corner. You're up in the corner. Now I can see you. I said Andy Powers a couple of weeks ago. I kept pointing to these guys because my screen looked totally different than what people saw on YouTube and it was totally confusing. So I got to make sure we're looking at the same thing. I got my trusty, (laughs) my trusty sidekick down there on the bottom, Chris Sharp. How you doing, Chris? Hey everybody. How's it going? I feel like I just hung out with you for eight hours, Chris. All day long, six feet apart, of course, but we (laughs) We were at the factory today. We were working. How you doing, Mr. Lund? I'm doing good. You guys were at the factory today? Yeah, we were at the factory. We were filming some stuff six feet apart. Yeah, everybody's got their social D working. Yeah, everybody's doing it. Social D, good band, too. Yeah. Okay, so amazing band. <laughs> amazing band. I, I think it was, honestly, I think it was some of Mike Ness's finest work, except for his couple of solo records, which were wonderful. Dude, but, Mike Ness is in- incredible. We could talk about this all day long. Um, I, yeah. I got to the chance to tour with, uh, uh, was on the same tour as that band and and i would watch their sound check like just i'll oh, man, they're just I'll, so good so good My um, people- all right so let's get into guitar nerdville because that's what people are waiting okay. to hear we got yeah, a the bunch questions of- are already coming through this is awesome man we already got questions andy got a cue for andy i love it all these people coming back zebo's back mike's back spider's back all right we're gonna get to this in a second but andy all right Andy Powers, let's dive right in. Can you give us a brief, the a brief history on flat top steel guitar, steel string guitar bracing? That would maybe okay. set the balance, set the conversation up for us. Okay. Well, I guess um, I'd preface that by saying, asking the question: Why is there, why are there braces in a guitar in the first place? Like, why are they? Why do they need to be there? And in simple terms it's because the guitar needs to be strong enough and sound good so they do two things they make the guitar strong so that it doesn't break and it makes the guitar sound good okay so how does it do that well wood is pretty trippy in that um it has different set of characteristics in all three directions all three dimensions of a piece of wood And so if you were to set that thing in motion, you make it start vibrating with a string, that vibration will propagate. It'll travel through the piece of wood at different speeds in different quantities, we'll say, at different times. So if you do that, you end up with kind of a weird hodgepodge of sound. You get kind of the musical part that you wanna hear. You get the non-musical noisy part you don't wanna hear. So you can use braces to keep the thing from breaking under the tension of strings and use it as a way to kind of selectively filter what sounds the guitar's making. So for steel string flat top guitars, 
I mean, that's a relatively young thing. That's like, give or take a hundred years now, which is pretty young in the instrument world. Guitars were nylon string or what, what we think of as gut strings up until then, you know, coming out of all sorts of, all sorts of uh, backgrounds, but most people will think of it as the loot version, you know, the loot train of train of thought. And so they had put little reinforcing struts in there to make it strong enough so it wouldn't break. They found out that they could make it sound a little better that way. And so largely they would put braces parallel to the strings. Makes sense, makes it strong enough that way. Sounds pretty good. We started looking for more volume because musical tastes started changing. You started hearing the guitar try to outpace instruments like the banjo in a noisier and noisier environment. Basically, the guitar came out of living rooms and parlors and went into clubs. You know, so you had people dancing, you had jazz bands, you had things like banjos that you were trying to compete with. So guitar makers wanted their guitars to be louder and louder. So we started adopting steel strings as a surefire way to make the thing louder, much higher tension, a lot more inertia in the string, a lot stronger, right? So when you hit that thing, you potentially could have a louder thing. So we started making the guitar physically stronger so that it wouldn't break with extra steel tension. And, you know, it's kind of this balancing act that we've been playing ever since of how do you make the thing louder? How do you make it sound appealing? How do you make it strong enough so that you have a respectable service life out of that thing? So in the short of it, it's basically a quest for volume and strength. I have a question, Jay. Yeah. How do we measure, you, you, you use the word tension a couple of times, Andy. So mm -hmm. if we think about a modern steel string guitar of average size, average scale length tuned to, to standard pitch. Yeah. How much tension and how do we measure that? How much tension is on the top of a guitar when it's strung that way? Well, that the simple answer is between, depending on the size of the strings, because different size strings, bigger strings will have more tension, smaller strings will have less tension. About 160-ish to about 180 pounds. Mm of string tension. Now, that sounds like a lot, and it is, but that's being pulled laterally across the top. So it's in the direction that the top is most strong. So it's not a direct amount of force that's being applied to the guitar's top. Mm. But because of that, you can see this super flimsy, thin little piece of wood. It's got a big job to do. Now let's, Let's back up a little farther. Okay, so we're looking at strength. We're talking about how much tension you put on there. You have a need to make something both flexible and strong, right? Because you want the thing to vibrate. That's what actually produces volume, right? You're trying to displace air. It's like, whether it's a speaker cone in somebody's electric guitar amp, a PA speaker, a violin, any instrument, it's all about air motion, right? You're trying to make this thing actually displace air. So it needs to be flexible enough to displace the air. And so the way you make a piece of wood do that is you make it thin, you make it relatively lightweight so that it can be set in motion easily. But the thinner and lighter weight that thing is, the less strong it becomes. So that's where this balancing act starts to come from. So when we talk about 160, ish pounds of string tension for a typical light gauge guitar string set with a fairly normal scale length. Well, that's a lot. And it's a ton when you consider how delicate the top of that guitar is just as a plain piece of wood with no braces. That's interesting. So, I mean, it, that's, that's crazy. Well, I have a question, Andy, yes. when did you start learning about different bracing styles, different bracing. When did you start actually tinkering around with, maybe if I make this adjustment here or this adjustment here, it'll affect the top differently. The second guitar that I built. 
<laughs> how old, started, how old were you? I was a kid. Yeah. I was I was eight, seven, eight, nine years old. I don't know, somewhere in there, probably about eight ish. But the reason I uh, the reason I did that is my the first guitar that I tried to put together, a first guitar shaped object. I didn't know that there were braces inside. I hadn't thought that far in advance. So I I had this super thin piece of wood. I made the top out of that. And when I tried to put strings on it, the entire thing exploded. And it specifically was the top that blew up, which I didn't understand at all. So, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I don't get it. And so I, once I um, kind of got over the shock of that, I went inside the house and looked inside our guitar because my family had a guitar. I went, okay, little beams inside, little sticks. That's the key. I need some of those little sticks inside. So I guess I can say guitar number two. That's where I started playing with that. Uh, and then, you know, you go down that rabbit hole and there's a million different ways you can do it and a million different ways that people have done it and searching for that ultimate, that ultimate fun guitar to play. So um, I've been at that for a while. So, so a lot of flat top acoustic guitars for years, we're talking north of a hundred years. Um, they were made with an X right down the middle. Um, why, w how did that come into play? How did somebody say, well, if we put an X here, it'll do what it's supposed to do. Well, that's actually a pretty interesting thing because the X, the X idea came into play long before there were steel strings. Okay. That was a, that was a Martin thing and a really cool idea. So they started adopting a different style of guitar. I mean, they were coming kind of from that German Austrian school of thought with real small body, kind of a figure eight, like a real tiny figure eight parlor type shape, or we think of them now as parlor guitars, rather than more of the Spanish flavor guitar. And they started dabbling in both and mixing styles. But that was, I want to say back in toward back towards the 1850s, throughout the 1860s, you you were seeing that being developed. I mean, I wasn't there then. This is just from guitars that I've worked on and books I've read and whatnot. And so you saw that come into play. I mean, decades before there were steel strings. I mean, they didn't adopt steel strings as a standard thing until the end of 1927. So you got a pretty long run of building X brace guitars for, with nylon or gut strings on them. And it was, a, it was a pretty good solution because you could make the thing pretty strong and maintain enough flexibility to make a pleasing sound. It worked pretty good. You know, it was a pretty nice balancing point to go, yeah, strong enough, flexible enough, you can make sound and it doesn't break. That's cool. So it, it was primarily just a guitar thing, almost more like an engineering thing than it was strictly for steel strings. And they further adapted that for steel strings as that became more popular. I mean, other companies like Gibson, Orville Gibson had some really interesting ideas. His guitars were primarily designed for steel strings all the way back into the 1800s. He was using music wire. And so his approach was to build carved top instruments where the strings were pushing on the top more than they were pulling or rotating the top, which is the basis of a, what we call an arch top guitar now, is a little more like a violin family thought you know, or a mandolin family type of thing where the strings were anchored back towards the end of the instrument and primarily they were pushing on the middle of the top. So he had developed a totally different style of instrument. You had other companies that were you know, somewhere in between the two. Back then, and I want to say early 1900s, Washburn had a pretty different style. They were using primarily a ladder brace design, things like that. How many different bracing styles have you used or tried? I mean, you, you're a, you know, a uke builder, you're you built mandolins, mm -hmm. you've arch tops i mean you oh, there's a lot of different flavors man i mean you look you kind of need to use what's appropriate for an instrument and it's based on what kind of a sound you want to get out of it how that thing is supposed to function 
what role it's supposed to play. I mean, there's a lot of different criteria, you know, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the same thing on an archtop guitar that I would even a mandolin, even though, you know, first glance, they're pretty similar. The structures can get radically different. So I don't know. I never really kept count of something like that. Interesting. I think it's a lot. It's few, definitely. I've tried hey. some things that didn't work. <laughs> there uh, is a good question that came in from Ginny um, in the comment section uh, just a couple of minutes ago. And while we're on the topic, um, obviously it, it does affect uh, the sound of your guitar, but different kinds of wood for your bracing. How does that affect the sound of your guitar? For example, how we use Sika spruce, but we also have used Adirondack spruce. Uh -huh. Where's where's the effect in your guitar's sound, volume, whatever it might be, by switching out to different woods? And what woods do you typically use when you're working with bracing woods? Okay, so the, the way that that influences the guitar has little to do with what species and a lot to do with the physical characteristics of what you're working with. Because different woods, I mean, primarily for tops and braces, we like to use coniferous trees. So um, think of a, something that looks like a Christmas tree. It's a tree that has needles and holds on to them all year round rather than like a leaf dropper. You know, that's a deciduous tree where leaves drop off in the fall. The reason we like conifers so the spruces, you'd look at pine, uh, say similar things, redwood, cedars, stuff like that, is those woods tend to be very, very strong for how little they weigh, okay? Now, some of those fall on a scale. So you have something like Western red cedar in the direction from leaves to roots or needles to roots, it's pretty stiff and strong, but not as strong as something like Adirondack spruce. Adirondack spruce is much, much stiffer. Okay, so what that translates to is one particular brace or one part having a different physical set of characteristics, a different resonance pattern, a different stiffness that it's gonna impart into the guitar top. To make really bold generalizations can lead to really inaccurate results. But by and large, you could say that a stiffer set of braces will tend to have more forceful power out of the sound. And a less stiff set of braces will tend to emphasize the low register and be set in motion more easily. So it'll respond to a lighter touch if you use a less flex or a more flexible, less stiff set of braces. It'll be set in motion easy but it, that sound won't have as much strength once it is set in motion, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that leads to further kind of generalizations to go, well, if you use an, a stiff Adirondack top and a stiff set of Adirondack braces, it's gonna be great for somebody who wants to hit the strings really hard because it'll make a really forceful, bold, powerful sound. On the flip side, if you're playing, say, with your fingertips, playing somewhat delicately, a softer material or a less stiff material with a less stiff top will tend to be set in motion more easily and have a little more kind of broadly warm sound overall. Again, super, super general kind of terms because you could make a brace that's really, really tall and stiff out of Western red cedar or some other soft material. And it could be way stiffer than a really skinny little Adirondack spruce brace. So it, it's kind of like this recipe where you have to take all the ingredients into account. Cool. That's awesome. Um, you know what? It's so great having one. Of, I mean, Andy, you might be the guitar nerd if some, if it was, <laughs> Looking it up in the dictionary, like guitar nerd, it would be your picture. So it's yeah, awesome. it's my glasses. <laughs> it's awesome to have you here, and we are getting some of the greatest questions and so much engagement. So first, I'd like to, or a side, I'd like to pause for a second and thank everybody okay. who's watching and enjoying and sending your questions in. They're really great. 
now, uh, a majority of the questions are around V-class bracing. So we're going to get there right. in a second. And before um, we start asking V-class questions uh, and how you developed V-class, I have to tell the watchers, the viewers here, a story about when Andy first showed the marketing department, department at Taylor Guitars V-class bracing. And he sat us down. Not, and, not my finest moment. It was so good. I have to. And I have to let the world know that it was so. Because we look at it like, you know what? First of all, you think Andy's Andy made his first guitar when he was whatever, eight. <laughs> and the rest of us were playing with Legos. But so Andy shows up in the room and we had lunch. And everybody was in the room and. I think every, we had pizza or salads. I don't know what it was, but Andy was explaining to us how X bracing works. And at one point he picked up a plate and he was explaining that it was like a speaker cone pushing air. And he picked up a plate and the plate had food all over it. And then he just started shaking it and the food <laughs> fell to the ground. It was the best most, I mean, it was so good. You got to understand that we enjoy working with you, Andy, because you go there. Thank you. You are. I, I appreciate. I appreciate you having grace on me. That was a long conversation. I remember. Um, I remember part of that after a couple hours in of trying to explain this, and you know, uh, I think Jim, uh, gen uh, the well-worded gentleman who writes wooden steel. You know, he's sitting there around the table going, <sighs> you know, just literally head in his hands going, there is absolutely no way that I can work with this. I remember. I, you know, I've been thinking Andy's about this about for years and working on it for years. And he's speaking about and, you. Uh, you know, so to try and. Steel Magazine. And I remember early though in those days too, when Jim Curlin I passed him in the hall or something, and I said, "Hey, man, I, I heard you. You got the download on from Andy on V Class. What's going on?" He goes, "He's like, dude, I put my iPhone on record, and it ran out of memory." Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh. no. so. Yeah, now, whatever. <laughs> okay, now that, so let's get let's get back to it. Now that we we brought some humor into this, um, we we all know. Everybody, when they first heard about V class, we all did this exactly the same thing you did. All of you watchers, we we did the exact same thing. We're like, no, and then we heard it and we said, maybe, and then we heard it again and we said, what did Andy just do? Oh man! So if you could, Andy. I know, give us a brief history on where it came from, what it came from, what you were thinking. I know a lot of people have heard it. If you want to give us a brief download on that, and then we'll get into some of these questions, it would be okay. well worth it. So the the backstory, I, you guys know I like surfing a lot. I like spending time in the ocean. And one of the things that I've been really interested in is using um, what people call lateral thinking where you're taking a scenario, like an observable scenario in one setting and applying that to another setting. You know, so you can learn stuff or have, uh, have little bits of information that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. And so in, um, I guess it was 2014. Yeah, it was at, at the Winter NAM show in 2014, we had launched our 800 series guitars we were relaunched them, you know, we redesigned them. And I'd spent a lot of time working on uh, like a really hot rotted version of an X brace design and push that thing to like kind of the brink of what we could do in a factory setting. And so we launched those and it's great because people love them and players are making all kinds of neat music with it. And then I come back to the shop a week or two later uh, okay, so now what? How do I make that better? I just put everything and one more, one more little tweak is going to be the straw that broke this camel's back. So now what? You know, so 
a couple days after that go by and keep in mind this is you know end of january and i knew there was going to be surf in the water so there's a pretty big swell on the way so i get up really early i go down to go surf and i had thought that the weather would cooperate but unfortunately this storm had gotten a little too close to shore and instead of good surf i get there first light and it looks like victory at sea. It's just this completely windblown, windswept mess of, an, of a seascape. So I'm standing up there on the bluff and it's cold and dreary and windy, you know, kind of bummed, sort of thinking, ah, I can still be asleep right now. And I can see there's swell in the water, but there's all kinds of distortion. So it's completely not rideable. A couple of days goes by, dramatic weather shift, and we start getting the Santa Ana blowing in, kind of like today where it's really hot and dry and wind's blowing offshore. And I'm up at a different surf spot. The same swell is in the water still. It's kind of the tail end of this. And the spot that I'd gone to is what we call a jetty setup where you have this big long rock jetty sticking out into an otherwise pretty straight flat beach break. And on either side of this jetty, there's just perfect clean riding surf just beautiful. And I'm looking at it, sitting in the truck, get, kind of getting ready to go out and like, man, this is what I want. This is, I want to build a guitar that has less of the inharmonic distortion, less of the noise and more of just the harmonic sound I want. I need to design something that looks kind of like this and that would work well. So that's kind of where the idea came from is watching this jetty set up and go, oh, well, I could do something like that. And then it would change the, the whole way that guitar works. That's worth pursuing. So that's kind of where that idea came from. Now, a few more bits and pieces. That seems pretty esoteric to describe. But in reality, it's like a hodgepodge, a mix, a sort of mutt of a lot of different instrument designs because there's parts that are very, they're totally steeped in the flat top steel string guitar tradition, parts that are somewhat gut string like, and parts that are borrowing pretty heavily from arch top guitars and even solid body instruments. So it's like taking a lot of different influences from different parts of the guitar's history and putting it into one context. Well, I think you did something pretty awesome. And uh, we think well, they're fun to play. They're really fun to play. Um, we have a running joke with um, Bob Taylor, and that is if you ask Andy if, if it's a good guitar, he says, it's a great guitar. It's fun to play, um, which is pretty much every single guitar Andy puts in his hands. So it's, it's, it's really fun. <laughs> Some are more fun than others, but, but that's the, to me, that, that is the measure of merit for an instrument is do you have fun playing music with it? That's what the thing's for. So if you have this guitar and you love playing it, man, the thing's working great. That is a great guitar. That's awesome. Uh, side question, how many surfboards do you have? I don't know, <laughs> not many. I mean, have you I've made got, your own surfboard yet? Yeah, I've, I've made some boards, mostly wooden boards. For There's... a while, I still am kind of into it. I got really into riding these Elias that are like thin, super thin finless wooden planks it's kind of like like the dry fly fishing of surfing you know it's fun ways to keep yourself amused when the surf is kind of small <laughs> so yeah there's lots of surfboards there's a big giant slab behind you that looks like a surfboard i know it'll turn into a surfboard one day but sharp yeah yeah that one's that one actually was started by another shaper it was a pair of shapers and uh, both of them have since passed on, and I haven't finished the board yet. But that one's a that one will be a solid redwood, twelve foot California hot curl style board. So sort of uh, sort of what guys would would have been riding this time a hundred years ago. That's that's amazing. All right, Sharpie, you know what time it is? Someday. <laughs> you know what time it is, Sharpie? I think we need to dive into some Q and A here because we got a lot of questions. So. Yeah. Okay. Stick Let's take the next 15 minutes or so and dive into some Q&A and then we'll we'll wrap up if you want. Maybe we'll even get Mr. Lund to play a song up there or something. That'd be fun. 
All right. A, there was a good yep. one that came through um, via email from David Shiver. I don't know if he's in the comment section, David, if you're here, we got one for you. Um, Andy, you talked about in 2014, redesigning the 800 series and then starting to, to come up with V-bracing. Uh, David's question was, how was V-bracing analyzed and tested to ensure long-term reliability? So good question. A lot, a lot of people do um, talk to us and ask like, so I, should I buy a V-class guitar now? Cause I don't know how it's gonna age, right? But yeah, we've had V-class guitars for a long time before we, we launched it. Can you, or for years, right? Before, yeah. we, before we launched it, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of things that we'll do to accelerate the aging process. One of them is that we'll put a guitar into what we know as the Humi chamber, which is a, a controllable kind of an autoclave where you can control the humidity, the temperature, pressure, things like that. And you can just, just try to ruin the guitar. So that's kind of an interesting real world effect to go, what does this thing do when it's super hot, super humid? I mean, pretend the guitar is in, I don't know, like the Philippines or someplace, you know, you go someplace really humid, really hot, things gonna blow up, what happens? What fails? Where does it go wrong first? Then you can go the opposite direction, go what happens when it goes extremely dry? So like if you live in the middle of the desert, what then? When does it crack? When do things fall apart? You can put a guitar through the hot car test, which is literally, you know, you put that thing in the trunk of your your car or on the dashboard. In a parked car sitting in direct sun, it'll get up close to 200 degrees in there. I mean, it literally will get cooking hot. So you watch where glue joints fail, what creep factors happen. You can accelerate it by playing with, these days, torrified woods are kind of all the rage. Well, you can do things like that to accelerate it and watch what happens as a piece of wood breaks down. You can jump up and down on them and break them. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's a lot of, call it empiric testing, which is break it and find out what happens. But the fact of the matter is, when you look at that guitar top and you compare it next to a different design, you can measure how strong it is in relation to other designs by terms of deflection, by strain and the, the way it moves. And for me, that was really enlightening because as soon as you look at the thing on paper, you realize, well, rather than a torsion kind of a strength, this is a very direct bending beam kind of a strength. And so if you were to simulate string tension and the points where that thing would be uh, supported and put say a weight right in the middle and watch how much it moves, it's incredibly strong. So just from doing that, you can develop a pretty high level of confidence of how the thing will respond to continuously loaded string tension for a lot of years. And so in that way, well, if it's functioning correctly, it by design is very strong. And in fact, the V-class idea, because one of its the principles is that we want it to be very strong parallel to the strings. That was one of the factors that we changed in order to give the long sustain that we like. So we have a pretty high measure of confidence that those things are gonna be around for a really long time. In fact, if I compare to say the archtop guitars and things that I've built, I would say without hesitation that a V-class style top will behave much better over a much longer period of time than a similarly appointed X style brace thing. That's, that's, that's amazing. Actually, I remember when we were filming stuff around the factory for um, V-Class, the V-Class launch, uh, I hadn't seen that, that chamber, that heating chamber you were talking about. And you actually yeah. pulled one out and it, you had an X-Brace top and you had a V-Class top in there. And it, I mean, was visible, the difference of how, I mean, it yeah. was wild. It's, it's pretty wild. Because so, certain parts of guitar bracing, you have to take into account that a top will have an expansion and contraction rate as it goes through temperature and humidity changes. 
So that's something that we want to be aware of and design around. Well, the way that the V-class idea works, it's not as directly susceptible to those changes. I mean, of course you wanna maintain your guitar at the proper temperature and proper humidity because that's where it's gonna work and sound best. But if you go looking at the, the woodworking behind that guitar and compare an X versus a V, it's not gonna move quite so far because of the design of it. In fact, that's something that we've seen in more humid environments where typically we talk about, we talk about watching for puffed up tops and neck angles that are shifting and things like that as symptoms of an overly humidified guitar. And it's become um, something we have to watch for because some of those symptoms don't show up quite so easily as they used to. In fact, some of them, we've seen a couple of guitars that were literally ruined by high humidity conditions. And unfortunately the main symptom wasn't there being a really puffed up top. So you go, ah, the thing that we used to watch for as the, the telltale sign, that's not, a, that's not a great indicator anymore. We gotta watch for fret ends, other, other joints failing and whatnot now. Sharpie, you got any more questions? Oh, let's see. I know we got a couple more in here. The the chat is firing right now. So I got one by Philip. I you? got one by Philip that's really good. Do different top materials, parentheses, Sitka versus mahogany, require different thickness in wood for V class bracing? Absolutely. Absolutely they do. Okay, because keep in mind that the way a guitar wants to work is you need to balance its strength, stiffness, and weight. Okay, so if you have a, like a Sitka top is pretty efficient. It's very strong for how little it weighs. That top can be made relatively thin, but a mahogany top weighs a little more and has a little less stiffness. So in some ways you could say, well, it's slightly less efficient. So what we typically do, we'll thin out that mahogany top a little more than we would a corresponding Sitka version. And then in conventional times, we would have made larger set of braces to help balance that out. With the V-class design, there's a little less of a distinction between the parts themselves because this, the design itself is so stiff uh, parallel to the strings. It's so strong that way. The smallest change in height is sufficient to, to affect the strength change that you need. So yeah, you're going to see a difference in top thickness and a does, small change in ideal that, circumstances. Does that, does that thickness or height of the actual brace change the tone? Radically. So, uh, because what we're looking at when we talk about tone and voicing this thing is largely a, me a measure of what stiffness and what flexibility you're allowing, you can start to think of it like a, like a structural engineer would. So if you were to look at most of those equations, which are super not fun, one of the, a, a good simple indicator, look at the cross section of a beam, like if you went back to calculus or one of those kinds of kinds of things, you look at a, a beam, like pretend that, um, okay, here's a ruler. Pretend that this beam were really thin, cross section like that. In all of those equations, you could take a cross section of a rectangular beam and go to factor this thing, strength in, I want to go width, so width of the beam, and then height, but the height is to the third power cubed. So that means that this thing is pretty flexible this way, really, really flexible that way. But if I were to turn that beam like this, and I go width times height cubed, this thing's really <laughs> strong that way. And so when you play with the height of a guitar brace, that affects the stiffness of that part by a huge amount. 
So the general takeaway is the height of a brace matters a lot. The thickness of a top will matter a lot. Go for it, Sharpie. Are you seeing the one I'm seeing? I'm seeing uh, exactly what you're seeing. <laughs> so Bill Murphy hangs out with us every week on this show um, and always has great questions. Here's one for you, Andy. Will the GS Minis ever get V-Class bracing, specifically the GS Mini Coat Plus, and would V-Class actually matter on it? Yeah, okay. So would V-Class matter? Yes, it would because you can't make a fundamentally altering change to the structure of a guitar without noticing the difference. As to when, if, or how we would do that, we don't have a definite plan in place, but I've got some ideas. Hey. Ha. That's my favorite answer he gives. Yeah, so, okay. okay, so don't, don't, I'll say, don't hold your breath because it's not gonna happen within the next couple of minutes, but. So what he should do is get thoughts? the COA Plus now, get used to the X bracing. If the V class comes out, he can do a compare and contrast at home is what you're saying. Sure. I see what you did. <laughs> I see what you did there. Um, of course, Sharpie, of course, do production more? Be, of course, production being what it is right now in the wake of, of COVID, man. If you can find any guitar, it's like, darn, darn <laughs> totally. that, uh, that slowed some things down. Yeah. Hey, uh, you know what? There, there's actually a good question. We were talking uh, before um, we got on with you, Andy. Uh, Andy Lund mentioned this. Um, we get these at events. Will V-Class ever come to nylon strings guitars that we make? Now that's something that would be really fun to do. I've actually done that. I've built quite a few guitars that way. And it's, it's fascinating to me because of course there's a bunch of alterations that you make to the basic platform because a nylon string guitar has way, way, way lower string tension. The strings behave in a different way. They have a different type of motion. It's a lot different than a steel string guitar. But what's fascinating to me is the V-Class idea work really well for those once it's appropriately voiced with an appropriately matched set of flexibility characteristics so yeah at some point in the future that's something i'd i'd love to pursue cool i have a question for andy <clears throat> yes sir um it's it's been real fun for well let's use the word fun because guitars are supposed <laughs> to it's been fun for all of us to get to experience new body shapes, new wood combinations that are built with V-Class. And it's always surprising uh, because of what you just talked about with the with um, how the braces work in conjunction with the type of top you're using, with the type mm -hmm. of body shape it's built upon. All those all those changes are slight are are slight, but they all add up to different sounds. And so it's always it's for us uh, as you've introduced new guitars, it's it's like uh, it's like every day is Christmas every time a new uh, new box comes down to open up, right? Because it's a whole new thing. Yeah. So I, as a player, if you stand back for a second and if you remove yourself from uh, from the designer that you are, and the history that you know about guitars and and surfboards and um and all kinds of uh, construction in general, as a player, what is it about V class that you um, you like the most or the maybe that was the most surprising thing to you or that you really feel contributed to the sound of future music? I love that the guitars became more different, right? That's one of the most, the most interesting things for me when I hear them is they, they do a better job reflecting both how a player is using the guitar as well as what other elements you brought into that guitar. Because we never hear just a bracing pattern. We never hear just the top wood or just the back. You hear the composite, you hear the entire instrument. And so that V idea, because we're allowed to filter out some of what I described as the noise or the chaos in that motion, it does a little better job reflecting the back wood, 
the size of the guitar, the type of strings that you put on it, the pick you're using, the way that you're playing it. So all of those colors, they become a little more distinct. You know, like they're a little sharper and more, um, a little more vibrant to me. And because before, every one of those designs has a little more of this inherent inharmonic distortion that's kind of clouding the sonic image. That's awesome. That's awesome. We got a few more questions. We have a ton of questions, and I think we're going to eventually, we would stay here on uh, this Taylor Primetime show all night long answering these questions. So I think we're going to. Well, I've got we, coffee in the house. We can, we can keep going. I know. We should, maybe we should do, uh, uh, when we when we launched the, the series, Taylor Primetime, for those of you who are just joining, um, this show is called Taylor Primetime. It's where a bunch of Taylor factory nerds get together and talk about guitars. And we're bringing as much nerd to you as totally as possible. Uh, but um, when Bob was first on, he had the idea of doing a live rapid fire Q&A. So I think we might have to do that with you as well, Andy, at some point. But right. we, have, we have a couple of more questions. We have a couple of questions in here. I'm going to take a step away from V-Class, we're bracing for a second, and I'm going to answer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 15. There's about 15 people in the in the comments over here that ask the same question. They all must follow you on Instagram because they see that you're building a, ukule a ukulele right now. Is Taylor, oh, yeah. Yeah. Is Taylor going to make a ukulele or not? Someday, maybe. If we feel like it, I feel like it's, <laughs> I feel like it's something I'm bound to do before I die because I've always built you because I love playing them. I love building them. Um, I've been building them since I was a kid because frankly, it's really easy to find a little piece of wood. It's easier than finding a big piece of wood. So it seems like a good instrument to make. So maybe someday. The problem is a lot of times when we start building a uke, it turns into a guitar. That was actually <laughs> that was actually where the baby Taylor came from originally. Is that was a uke, and Bob thought oh, I should probably just turn it into a guitar because that would be fun. So that's where the baby Taylor came from. I mean, I've built um, we built some uh, what do we call them? The Builders Reserve ukes. Those were fun because those were largely hand built ukes. So there's some of those, and I build them for for some artists from time to time and for friends and whatnot. So yeah, sometimes, but maybe someday. That's awesome. <clears throat> All right. We got a couple more questions then we'll wrap it up. Yep. Real quick. Uh, we have one that, Hmm. First, here's a good one. Why? Hmm. I'm trying to find, Oh, there it went. Uh, is there a plan to update the 916 with a sound port cutaway? Ooh. Does that even exist? Well, I, I built one. <laughs> so yes, there's one, <laughs> but I, but I think it's out on tour currently with, how did that get out with? A lot of the prototype guitars go out with different musicians and they, you know, they're kind of road testers and they see what things are working like and what, what breaks and what doesn't. Um, there's no firm plans to do that at this second, but at some point, maybe, because it would be a really cool guitar to make. Awesome. I love the way those guitars work. It's, it's so fascinating. It's a complex set of air motion. Man, that was, that was a real treat. That one was a fun guitar to make. So we can dive into that real quick. So what we're talking about, if you know, um, this year we launched uh, two of them, but one was a Builder's Edition, the Builder's Edition 816, where Andy tweaked what our normal Grand Symphony looked like. He changed it up a bit, added what we call a sound port cutaway, which is kind of sitting in a scooped cutaway. Um, what makes that guitar different? I mean, people have seen a dual aperture or a second sound port of some sort, mm -hmm. or um, what makes that guitar different? Okay, so in a nutshell, the two apertures matter 
but it has to do with how you're allowing the air motion to work with the body, okay? So that project started as pretty simple, let's adapt the V-class architecture into the Grand Symphony. And when I look at that, I again, I like to look at, at a guitar and think, well, what does this guitar naturally want to do? What does it want? What kind of musical usefulness should it have? Because otherwise it's being redundant and that's not fun. That's not, that's not an interesting guitar to play or to make, frankly. And so I wanted that guitar to have a different type of quality where it has a more kind of orchestral sort of sound, like a more lyrical voice. And so that one, uh, using the two aperture version, we could use a little larger air mass inside the body. That's the difference between like a Grand Auditorium, a Grand Pacific and a Grand Symphony has to do in large part with the amount of air that's inside the body. Now it's got this set of curves and you could take a ruler and look at it and go, yeah, they're not radically different, a little different, but, but the different curves that encapsulate that air determine how much is there. And so we wanted to build something where we could use these two apertures, one of them set at an angle in relation to the primary aperture as a way to diffuse that sound and let it propagate out in a different way. So it's, in a nutshell, it sounds different because it is different. It's more <laughs> of a, it's more of like the opera singer of guitars and less something that would shout. Oh, that's a good, that's a, I like how, I like, that's well put, Andy. It's as if you oh. built it. All right, we got. Well, well, yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> you uh, want to talk I, about I, it? I, yeah. I, 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 I keep going. That one's. It's a. It's a really complex design, and so it, it has a lot of interest for me because it's so fascinating. The short, the real short part that I would add is, if you think about what kinds of sounds make a uh, interesting musical quality you want to de delete anything that sounds like noise, okay? Right? You want to allow the musical part and delete the stuff that sounds like noise. So if you were to say, it's great to have dynamic range in a guitar because you can always play a guitar more quietly. So you think loud is a good quality to have. What's the opposite of loud? A lot of people are gonna say soft but that's not quite right. The opposite of loud would be quiet, right? Soft is more of a qualitative characteristic. The opposite of soft would be hard. And a lot of times when you build a guitar and you want to make it loud, it takes on this hard, brash kind of quality. It's like somebody getting right up in your face and shouting. There's a lot of distortion and edge on the front part of the note that's coming out of their voice. And that's not necessarily an appealing quality. So with that Grand Symphony guitar, I wanted to build something that had a lot of dynamic range, but a very soft characteristic. So that when you play it, even if you're playing with a heavy hand and it's kind of forceful and big sounding, it has this soft characteristic that makes you lean into it. It sounds like an opera singer singing just a couple of feet in front of you where you sort of lean in and it becomes real appealing. That's a that's a particularly interesting guitar. I think what we're going to have to have you do is come back on the show and just talk about the the new Grand Symphonies. I think that's what we're going to do. So, but since we're fair enough, we don't have all the time. We're going to go back and uh, answer a couple of more questions real quick. Okay. Um, this is a great question uh, by Alec. As an amateur guitar builder, would you recommend I build a V-brace plan or stay away? Well, that one has that that question has a couple of potential uh, hiccups in it because technically the V-class idea is a patented idea, and so I'm not supposed to encourage that. But I love that people make things, so I think you should make what you feel like making. Um, all the guitars are interesting to build, and there are by no means a 
set number of ways that it can be done. There are, there's literally, there are no limits as to what you can make. So for a, when I was, I guess I'm, I kind of think of myself as still learning how to build guitars because kind of the more you learn, the more there is to know. You just start to become aware of all the things that are still there for learning. I would look at a guitar and go, yeah, if you build a handful of guitars, start with the classics and have a good frame of reference as to where we've been as a community of guitar makers and players. Because it's hard to look at an existing design and not understand how it works, who it should be for, what kinds of music were made with it, how people play it, how they relate to it, how they respond to it, what sounds they draw from it. It's really good to have that kind of understanding as to where we've been as guitar makers. So I love building in traditional styles, using traditional designs, and then let that inform the types of choices and make alterations or deviations from there based on what each maker wants to derive out of the guitar. Does that make sense? Yep. That makes uh, sense. I, I forget that, uh, that I can't hear you directly. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's not, uh, not quite the same as a real conversation. That, that makes that makes all the sense. Uh, okay, so I'm going to say two more questions, and then we do a part of the show called Sharpie's Question, which is fun. So three more questions, okay. and then we'll wrap all right. it up. All right. Next question uh, is, is V-Class more noticeable in person, entirely acoustic, or when amplified, or when recorded? Volume, sustain, intonation. Question. Wow. Um... I'm not sure that I could say it's more noticeable in one context versus the other because you're gonna hear it. It's a, it's a radically different guitar. I love, that said, I love listening to them through microphones. So in a recording environment with microphones, because that microphone is typically, they're so receptive to the type of air motion that these guitars are making and it's, it's a real treat to listen to. You know, they do very, very different things. Like, even if you were to compare a Grand Auditorium that's V-classed and the Grand Pacific, radically different sounds in front of a microphone. And then you put that Grand Symphony in front of a microphone, and it's radically a different sound again. And the microphone placement in the case of the Grand Symphony is entirely a different animal than what you would do with a, a grand auditorium. So amplified, yes, you're gonna hear it. Amplified, most of these guitars will be a little more reflective of what the players bring to the string. So they tend to be a little cleaner and clearer sounding through the ES2 pickup system that we're using. In person, it's plainly obvious, but for, for me, particularly in front of a microphone, that's where it becomes so dramatic because you've isolated things just to the air that's hitting that capsule. Yeah, I would agree. Andy Lund, you do a lot of recording. What what have you noticed with V-Class? Well, I, I have, and I've, I've actually had tracks that were recorded with acoustic guitars and, and I was happy with what I had. And then all these new guitars started coming out and I thought, well, this is a really good chance to go in and A, B things. And so I have had experience with recording some of Andy's earlier pre-V-Class guitars and then playing the exact same part in the same room with pretty much the same microphone preamp setting and then being able to A, B them. And I, what I hear and, and what I appreciate most about E class is you know Andy Andy used the word enharmonic distortion. So for a lot of us what it, what it means is that the guitar sounds more in tune. And it and there's less fighting, there's less rubbing between notes. You know, Jay and Chris and I we we've talked in the past about the journey as a musician. Your ears get better as you, as time goes on. You learn things, you hear things that you didn't hear 
when you first started. And this is an example of how that can happen in a design, I think, because when I, I can play voicings, there was a spot at some point in my guitar playing career where I was like, man, I can never get that. Why does that, that particular chord always, <laughs> why is that? And then you would get yeah. your guitar tuner out and you would tune it. So that chord sounded right. And then another one would sound wrong. Oh man. So sorry, that was a long answer, but, but it's, it's really, that's really obvious. Once you learn how to play guitar and you've, you've been listening, learning songs, trying to sing, you know, along with the guitar. Um, and so what I noticed is just that the way that the notes combined and the way that they settled together on the tracks that I redid is, is completely, completely different in a good, in a good way, in a more musical way. Yeah, I would agree with everything that you said. Uh, recording via class guitars is really, really fun. It's really interesting. I find more sometimes I'm not. I would be what some call a failed guitar player because I can only count to four and I play bass. But um, uh, at least I'm not left-handed. Zing, right, sharp? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Oh. I'm kidding. Anyway. Um, when we have Rob McGargle on here, you're going to be in trouble. I understand. <laughs> um, but I would say the same thing. What I've enjoyed about V-Class Bracing, Andy, is being able to mic things in a little bit less standard or safe ways mic mm -hmm. over the shoulder mic across the room put a mic over here just throwing microphones up i would agree with you i think that it v class on a microphone has just been a, a whole new special you know moment in guitar building and i think it's really really incredible um before it's we get into, before we get into sharpie's question uh i think we're going to add a new segment of the show and it's going to be called uh, Stump the Guest. Okay. All right. I got it. <laughs> We're going to try and stump the guest. All right. Ready? This one comes in from our wonderful friend, Steven. And it is, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? <laughs> That's it. Hello. Hello. Hmm. You know what? <laughs> An unladen swallow. Airspeed velocity. Well, I guess it depends on if it's flying or not. <laughs> there you go, Steve. There you go, Steve. You got your question answered. We love you, man. Thanks for joining and watching the show. All right. Now that segment, the next segment is called Sharpie's question. There you go. That Sharp was a great answer. Jeez. Sharpie's been at Taylor Guitars for 12 years, and yeah. sometimes he doesn't get to ask all the questions he wants to. So, Sharp, go ahead. What is your question for Andy? You know, it's funny is we actually have talked about this every day that we've done this show, that we need to have a, some sort of noise that goes into this, some sound effect. And my dad has an air horn app on his phone. I wish I had that right now. Do, 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 do. But anyways, um, Andy, this has nothing to do with bracing. Uh, it's just a okay. question I, I've always had for you. So you've worked obviously with tone woods, all sorts of um, different woods in your guitar making career. Which tone wood have you yet to work with that you're excited to try out building a guitar with? That's actually a pretty easy question. I've become really interested in red iron bark eucalyptus. Okay, we've. Um, We've started a number of years ago, we started dabbling with urban woods. Yeah. And we probably don't have time for the whole story there, but I'm really interested in using urban woods because it's fascinating to look around your own neighborhood and go, wait a minute, there's all kinds of trees and a bunch of them I could use for making all sorts of interesting wooden things, guitars included. And so we've started to bring that into our guitar making world in the form of the Shamalash Builders Edition, uh, the 324 guitar that we launched at this last winter NAM. That's the first time that we've been able to use an urban harvested wood in a larger setting. And it's been absolutely just so fun, right? Because the wood just surprises us with how great it is. It sounds great, it works great. 
It's like everything that you could love about a wood, this thing's got. And alongside that, there's a boatload of other interesting species that would be really cool to try. I started to make some parts with, um, it's a relatively common eucalyptus species here in Southern California, but it has a remarkable set of characteristics. It's a really, really great density, uh, super interesting machining characteristics. You can dry it pretty well. It's got all kinds of really interesting things going for it. So I'd be excited to use that one. I've been playing with it in small quantities for uh, maybe a couple of years, but I've never built a whole guitar using that. I don't know that I could build the back or sides out of it, but it'd be interesting to try. I haven't, uh, haven't done that yet. Just been building small parts like a bridge or fingerboard. It's, that stuff's amazing. So that one I'm really interested in. That was a good question, Chris. Hey, I thought about it for two weeks. I'm proud of you. That was a great question. <laughs> um, all right. So as we wrap up the show, um, just a reminder that we're gonna we're gonna go live with Taylor Primetime every Tuesday at six PM Pacific time. Um, so no no longer Tuesdays and Thursdays, just every Tuesday. So Taylor Tuesday, we're gonna get on with different guests. Uh, next week we have our director of natural resources sustainability, Scott Paul. Um, oh, that's I'll, that'll be fun. That'll be fun. He's uh, spent a number of years at Greenpeace. Um, the, the explanation uh, when Bob Taylor introduced Scott Paul to Taylor Guitars, he said, yeah, you know, I hired the thief to guard the castle. Uh, so it's uh, there's more to that, and we'll talk about it when we get Scott Paul on. So join us next Tuesday at 6 p.m. That was it. Uh, Andy Powers, Andy Lund, Sharp, but Andy Powers, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. That was fantastic. I think we answered a lot of questions. I know there are a lot more about bracing, so we're definitely going to have to have you come back on. But, I'd, be, uh, I'd be happy to. I appreciate it. Uh, and as you guys see, Andy's sitting in his home workshop. This is where where yep. some of the guitar magic happens. Uh, follow Andy Ground on, Zero. <laughs> follow Andy on Instagram, Andy Taylor Powers, at Andy Taylor Powers. And you can watch him right now. He's building a, a ukulele, which is pretty fun to watch fun so uh anybody else have anything before we sign off yeah if this is your first show make sure you hit the subscribe button uh check back on tuesday and tell your friends give us a yeah. thumbs up and keep watching taylor primetime we uh can't thank you enough all right we're gonna sign off guys have a good evening all right guys take it easy